Yay Networks. Welcome to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Raban. Today's episode is our monthly Q&A. So we have, uh, we've gotten a bunch of questions from you guys through our social media outlets, and we're gonna try to answer them. And hopefully if you ask the questions, you can hear your question being asked and, and answered. And as always, I am accompanied by my trusty producer, Maria Extraordinaire. Como estas? Well, thank you. How are you? Fantastic. Sunday, it's hot. I'm inside. It's AC. I'm good. Hey, it's hot here in Miami too. Believe me. It's... Uh, we we've had a hundred degrees here for a whole bunch of days. A hundred degrees. That's that's crazy. Yeah. I don't pay these kind of taxes for a hundred degrees. <laughs> We're at 96, 97, but it feels like over a hundred. Yeah, and but you're Florida. Florida, you can you don't get to bitch. You guys don't pay the same taxes in California. God damn it. We're starting to. We're starting to pay more taxes. Then you're gonna have to move. All right. What do you got for me, Maria? Fire away. What you got? Okay. So the first question that we have is from Laura eleven twenty four. Laura eleven twenty four. What's your question? Okay. So the question is I got saline breast implants approximately 15 years ago, but not sure if I have to change them or not. I get regular mammograms and during my annual checkups, my doctor tells me everything is okay. What should I do? So uh, we get that question asked all the time. So in general, in general, we recommend you change your implants every 10 to 15 years. That's what we recommend, right? That's what we generally recommend. Having said that, having said that, it kind of depends. It depends on you have saline or silicone. So why do we recommend that you change your implants every 10 to 15 years? We recommend it because, um, because after a certain period of time, these are devices. They're like light bulbs, door, door handles, or hinges. There's something that can break. And so the idea about changing them is you want to change them before they break rather than after they break. The reason you want to do that is not because if you change them after they break, they're dangerous. It's just annoying. So it's the distinction between a planned and emergency C-section. Mm. A planned C-section, you can plan it. Bring in your suitcase, have your family over, blah, blah, blah. An emergency section, oh shit, uh, oh my God, my water broke. So if you know that your implants are getting older and you are it's time for you to exchange them. You can schedule it. You can take time off work. You can plan your life. You can get a nanny, whatever you need. But if you don't and they break, then it's kind of like, oh, shit, my implants are broken. Now, it's not an emergency, but you're going to feel stressed out and you're going to be under pressure to get it done quickly. Okay, so silicone implants, when they break, it's a silent rupture. You won't know that they broke. They'll just be quiet. And you'll find out that they break through other things like, huh, that's odd. My breasts look a, weir- a little weird. Hmm, the shape is odd. Oh, that's interesting. My breast kind of feels a little firmer than before because they're encapsulating. So we want you to generally replace them before that happens because you might miss them being ruptured for a while because you're not paying attention. Saline implant, the only, and I mean the only advantage of a saline implant is that when it breaks, you'll know, <laughs> right? You'll go to bed, you'll wake up and it's broken. And it's gonna be like, flip, deflated, completely deflated. And so technically you can ride those tires till they're bald. Meaning you can go and go and go and go and go and go and then they'll rupture. That might be 18 years, that might be 22 years, that may be 37 years. And when they break, you'll know. And then you can go get them changed. The issue is when they break, they're going to break at an inconvenient time. You're gonna be in Hawaii. It'll be weeks before your wedding. Your kid's having a recital. You know, they're not going to break at a convenient time. So now you have one breast full and one breast deflated. Can you imagine how that's going to disrupt your life? Again, it's better to plan it, exchange them, move on. So the answer is if you have a saline implant and they look fine, they feel fine, theoretically, you can just keep going till they break. But when they break, you're going to want to be get them replaced ASAP. And that might not be conducive to your life. Financially, physically, emotionally, a whole bunch of, you know, it may just not be the right time. So change them every 10 to 15 years. Okay, so this next question, uh, you're going to see it's a lot about breasts in this uh, episode. Okay. This one is from Barb1026. Barb? 
10, 26, what you got? When getting a mammogram with implants, can this type of cancer be detected easily or is it recommended to have an MRI? Which kind of cancer? You didn't elaborate. Oh, it doesn't say. I okay. think you were referring to this new FDA uh, yeah. announcement, which oh. is referring to the two cancers that are um, so-called breast implant associated. One was ALCL, mm -hmm. ALCL being uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and then this sort of new one, which is squamous cell carcinoma. And again, they're both related with the capsule, not the breast tissue. So mm -hmm. remind me what the question was now. When getting a mammogram with implants, can this, can this cancer be detected easily or is it recommended to have an MRI? So the answer is these two types of cancers, which again are called BIA, breast implant associated cancers, are not detectable on mammogram. They are not detected on mammogram because they're not breast tissue. They're scar tissue around your implant. And so there are different methods of helping diagnose. They're not, they're, there's, there's no one test that, oh, there it is. Um, ultrasound helps if there's fluid around the breast, aspirating fluid and sending it for cytology helps. MRIs can sort of help. PET scans can sort of help. So there is uh, no specific uh, study, but definitely mammograms don't help with these two types of cancers. So you're going to go to, if you have a symptom that you're, you're going to go to your doctor and then they'll assign you to do an MRI or whatever. Right. Because what happens is these, these two cancers present with swelling most of the time. Like, God, that's odd. My right breast is so much more swollen than my left. Right. You're not going to just ignore that. You're going to go see your plastic surgeon. They're going to send you to go get an ultrasound to study, blah, blah, blah. So that's how that normally presents. Got it. Okay. The next question comes from Sylvia 913. Sylvia 913. What's the next question? Okay. How do you prevent rippling in the implant? How do you prevent rippling in the implant? So that's a good question. So first of all, what is rippling? There's two types of rippling. There's visual rippling and there's palpable rippling. Visual rippling is you're standing there, you're looking at someone and you're like, holy shit, I can see the rippling on their, I can see the ripples. Let me back up a step. What is a ripple? A ripple is a wave in an implant. So an implant that's soft, like a pillow that's soft, has ripples in it. An apple that's hard has no ripples in it. It's smooth. So when you can see the rippling or feel the rippling, that's what you're referring to. Certain implants ripple more. So saline implants tend to ripple more than silicone implants. So if you're concerned, if you're concerned about rippling, I would recommend a silicone implant. Breast tissue makes a big difference. If you are an A cup, super skinny, not a lot of breast tissue or fat on your body, you're more likely to ripple, which is you're more likely to see the ripples than if somebody who has, you know, heavier woman with more breast tissue. Because remember, this is all about camouflage. You always have the rippling. It's a matter of whether you can see it or feel it. Putting it under the muscle versus over the muscle definitely makes a difference significantly in terms of the amount of rippling you can see and feel. But all breasts that are soft, that have a soft implant, you'll always be able to feel a little bit of rippling in the bottom of the breast. That There's no way around that. Okay. Next question um, comes from Alina1220. Okay, Alina1220, okay. How do you decide if the implant goes over or under the muscle? So listen, there are seldom, if any, reasons, indications, in my opinion, for putting the implant ever above the muscle. So what is the reason for that. Number one, when you put the implant above the muscle, the probability of having rippling where you can see it is significantly higher because the implant is not covered by the muscle in addition to the breast tissue. When you put the implant above the muscle versus under, the transition of the implant where it attaches to the chest looks much faker and the breast implants look like they just come right off of your chest. 
as opposed to when it's under the muscle, it the upper pole, the upper part looks a little smoother and like has a little bit of a slope. When you put the implant above the muscle, the likelihood of it encapsulating and turning hard like a rock is above 50%. That's big. When you put it below, it's five to 10%. That's not as big. So I don't really have any indication for which I put it above. The only times we ever put it above is if you are a professional bodybuilder and when you put the implants under the muscle and you are competing and flexing, well, when the muscle is flexing in your chest, the implants move. And it's the patients who are professional bodybuilders and competing don't like that look. Other than that, I can't tell you a reason to do it. Got it. Okay, the next question. You're not going to compete, are you, Maria? No. No, those days are gone. Uh, Way gone. <laughs> Way gone. <laughs> Okay, the next question comes from Renee from Dallas. All right, Renee from Dallas, what you got? Her, uh, her question is, can capsular contracture be prevented? The answer is yes and no. What is capsular contracture? So capsular contracture is, as again, we said, implant goes in your body, foreign material, doesn't matter, pacemaker, prosthetic, knee, heart valve, whatever. Your body's like, oh, what the hell is this shit? It then protects you. It shall creates a scar tissue around it. It separates you from it, and that's a capsule. Some individuals, their body decides to do them a favor, really protect them, and it makes a thick, strong, voracious scar. That's called capsular contracture. That generally presents as, hmm, that's odd. My right breast seems so much harder than my left breast. Huh, my right breast seems so much higher and weird shaped than my left breast. So, the question is, can we prevent that capsular contracture from happening? And the answer is yes and no. You can't prevent it because we don't know exactly what causes it, but you can highly reduce the probability of it. So here are all the things that your surgeon can do to reduce the probability of you getting capsular contracture. And by that reduce, I'm talking to like under 5%. One. Place the implant through the crease or fold of the breast as opposed to through the areola. When you stick the implant and put it through the areola, you are rubbing it on breast tissue and breast tissue has bacteria. The current theory behind capsular contracture is something called biofilm. And biofilm is a microscopic subclinical, low-grade inflammatory infection. So it's neither here nor there. You can only see it under the microscope. So put the implant under the fold. Two, put the implant under the muscle. Again, 10% opposed, as opposed to above the muscle, 50% capsule contraction. Three, do not make a messy pocket. Blood in the pocket where you leave the implant will 100% lead to capsular contracture. Why the hell would a doctor leave blood? Because you're doing the surgery in 30 minutes. You don't give a shit. You're doing seven, 10 of these a day. Bam, boom, bam. Low, you know, uh, what do you call it? Cheap, $3.99, you know, buffet style breast implant. So you don't have time to pay attention and cauterize the edges you do a lot of blunt dissection, meaning just traumatic separation. So this is when it's important when you question your doctor how they do the procedure. If they tell yeah, you but really quickly, you know that- they're Listen, not Maria, there is a saying, you get what you pay for. So mm -hmm. if you pay very little, you get very little. If you pay a lot, you don't necessarily get a lot. But you know for a fact, if you pay a little, you're gonna get a little. No one's gonna give you a lot for a little. That doesn't even make sense. Right. The next thing is you shouldn't, your surgeon shouldn't touch the final implants. So there is a device that some guy made, which whoever this guy is, is retired in Bora Bora. Mm -hmm. And it's a funnel and it's called a Keller funnel. And that guy is Dr. Keller. And you take the implant straight out of the box. It's sterile. Drop it in the funnel and the funnel shoots the implant into the pocket so that you do not touch the implant. And that the idea is you're not 
putting bacteria on the implant. So why the hell wouldn't everybody use it? Because the funnel costs money. And breast implants, cheapo, low-grade breast implants are about saving money. Next, you want to wash the pocket with irrigation that has antibiotics and betadine. So you really want to make sure the pocket has been cleaned and irrigated. And lastly, I exchange gloves throughout the procedure. So when I'm ready to put the implants in, I put in put on brand new gloves. These are all the things you can do to reduce, not prevent, caps or contracture. Well, um, that's all for breasts right now, but we have more questions. We have questions regarding um, facelift. And, and also, uh, someone wants to know what the state of plastic surgery is going to be like in the next five to 10 years. So we'll have more of that when we come back. Is that your teaser? Was that your way of teasing people to like stay tuned? Yes. Guys, Maria is a professional. Did you see that? <laughs> you are just at the edge of your seats waiting to hear about facelifts <laughs> and the... <laughs> you like throw me under the bus <laughs> yeah, i just thought it was cute i really liked how you teased that for very all right guys we're gonna take a quick break we'll be right back to the second half of plastic surgery uncensored welcome back to plastic surgery uncensored we are doing q a's answering your deepest and uh, most eager questions from our social media uh um catch of your questions i'm here with maria my producer what you got, Maria? Something about facelifts? What you, what's your question? Okay, so from Denise Campbell, 1115. Denise Campbell, 1115. Here's your question. What is the recovery like from a deep, plain facelift? What is a deep, first of all, what is a deep, right. plain all right. facelift? So, so the question is, what is the recovery from a deep, plain facelift? So we have to obviously define it. So facelifts can sort of be defined into three categories. So one category, the quick and dirty, cheapo, easy, quick surgery is a skin only facelift where your surgeon will go underneath the skin, separate the skin, pull the skin, remove the excess and close. And that's called a skin only facelift. That means that underneath the skin, which is your muscles, those muscles are not being manipulated, moved, altered. The advantage of that for the surgeon is that it's way less stressful and quick and dirty and easy. The second way to do a facelift is to go under the skin and do something with the muscle layer such that you are manipulating the muscle layer, but stay above it. So you're gonna remove a section and sew it, or you're gonna tighten it like you're doing diastasis. You're going to sew the muscle up because you're lifting the deeper structures, hence the word deep plane, the deeper structures are the muscle layers, your face is skin and muscle. But again, the advantage of that for the surgeon is that it's not very stressful because you are staying above the muscles. The third, and in my opinion, the most effective way of doing a facelift is to do a deep plane facelift where you go under the skin and then under the muscles, and then you elevate the muscles with the skin attached and you use the muscles to lift the face. The reason why that's advantageous is you don't put any stress or strain on the skin, which stretches, and you're re-elevating the deeper structures, which if you look at a person who's aged, many of those structures have sagged. So it's not just your skin that's sagged. So then the question is, well, why the hell would everybody do that? Because it's super stressful. It's a much, much more difficult technical surgery. Why? Because under the muscles are all the nerves. All the nerves that allow you to move your face are under the muscles. And so the stakes are high. That mm -hmm. means that if your surgeon is under the muscle trying to elevate the muscle and re reposition it and they cut or damage one of the nerves, you will could get paralyzed. You could lose the corner of your mouth moving. You could lose the ability to raise your eyebrow. That's big. No, I know someone that that happened to. And, well, and it so, was, it was like 30 years ago. Yeah. But still it. Yeah. So, so, so again, 
go big or go home, plastic mm -hmm. surgery is about risk reward. So if you go to Vegas and you play the slot machine for four days, you will not be stressed, yet you won't make a lot of money and you won't lose a lot of money. But you could walk home with 500,000 bucks, but you got to play roulette with big money. So in the facelift world, the deep plane is considered the gold standard. Um, that's the way I do my facelifts. Um, and so as a result, that's what she was asking. Now, it turns out that facelifts in general are very forgiving. Whether you do type one, type two, or type three, by and large, the recovery is more or less the same. Really, pain is mild to moderate. It's not a really painful procedure as compared to a breast dog or a tummy tuck. If done correctly, swelling and bruising should be mild to moderate. And you should be able to get back kind of to like society in about 10 to 10 to 14 days. So in general, it's not terribly bad. The younger you are, the less work you need, the quicker you recover. So if you do your surgery at your early 50s, when you're starting to get a little neck band and some jowling, you require less work than if you're in your 70s and you got a boatload of skin in your neck, really long muscles, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. Does that answer your question, Maria? Yes, it answered the question. Good, good. I, I, and I remember that woman. It scared the hell out of me. Yeah. Okay, so the next question comes from Emmy underscore Mac. Emmy underscore Mac. Mm -hmm. What should I do to be a good surgery patient? Prep, recovery, recommendations, please. Uh, what should I do to be a good patient? That's makes me, what should I do to be a good little boy? That's a good patient because... Just the fact that they're asking, that makes them a good patient. Right. Okay. So the number one thing to be a good patient, number one, is be a good person. So that sounds like, oh, existential, but it's true. It's very difficult to take care of people that are unpleasant. That's the number one thing I hate about my job. Nasty people. I don't mind almost anything, but people that are... Um, unaware, demanding, unreasonable, ungrateful. So be a nice person. You are asking someone to help take care of you. So have a sort of sense of respect and a little bit of conscientiousness. That doesn't only apply to you, but it, I mean, to the surgeon, but the entire staff. Right. I can't tell you how much better my staff functions for a patient when he or she is sweet as opposed to sort of difficult, demanding, unreasonable. So that's a no-brainer. Be nice. And mm -hmm. as a result, you get better care. Now, what you can do is just be a healthy person. So most surgeries, when you're overweight, you don't do well. Surgeries don't go well. Your face is heavy and it doesn't lift well. Your belly is big and you don't get a good tummy tuck. Your, he your breasts are heavy and they sag again. Being overweight as it applies to cosmetic surgery, leads to both poor cosmetic outcomes as well as infections and blood clots and all those other things. So don't be overweight. Eat a normal diet. You don't, you know, people constantly always ask me, what supplements did I have? Nothing. You don't need any supplements. Just, just be normal. I mean, you can't have Twinkies every day. You don't have no nutrition. But if you eat a normal diet, I don't know, I have chicken, turkey, beef, I have potatoes, rice, I eat, I don't know, tortillas, like just regular food. The diet is really not that relevant. It's calories and weight that's relevant. Know what the hell you're getting yourself into so that you can be an easy patient to take care of. So don't go three quarters of the way and then like, oh, oh no, I didn't realize, oh, I should have. Then you, you're, you're, you're driving everyone nuts. These are big decisions. So prepare yourself, ask questions, make sure that when you pull the trigger, there's no going back. You just follow through and execute. And then the most important thing, just listen to your damn doctor. I can't tell you how many people I tell them A, B, C, D. Do A, B, C, D post-op. I swear to God, Maria, they come in to do A, C, and Q. What? What the, f what happened to B in, what, 
why are you what ha why are you adding Q to the quiz? Ah, I talked to my friend. I my, my friend's doctor. Uh, I on I, I Google what? Hello? So just follow the instructions. I don't understand. You paid me all this money. I give you instructions. Just do the instructions. So it sounds like what you need to do is less related to like preparatory work, more just be one with the process, flow, be easy. Find yourself a great doctor and let them take care of you. For me, the biggest issue is patients just throwing a wrench into things. And uh, it just doesn't, it makes it less fun. Yeah, of course. Okay, this one comes from uh, Surgical Times. Uh, they want to know predictions. Where will plastic surgery be in five to 10 years? So, I mean, I think plastic surgery is fascinating. I'll tell you why. Number one, it will never go away. Never. A hundred years from now, plastic surgery will be present. 500 years from now, it'll be present. Because the very premise of plastic surgery is the connection between what some people would refer to vanity. But vanity has this horrible kind of connotation, like vanity or, or vain. All that means is that you look in the mirror and you are aware of your being and you care that, hey, I, I haven't shaved and I haven't brushed my teeth and I smell horrible and I need a haircut and I want to look my very best. So that doesn't go away. That's part of the human psyche. Mm -hmm. Cleopatra, the African tribes, you name it. There is nowhere in the world, no society, no religion, no time in history where people didn't give a shit. They always did. Every painting by Van Gogh, if you paint a woman, whether it was that they, at the time trends will change. Curvy, not curvy, skinny, big boobs, small boobs, big nose, small nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trends will change. But there'll never be a moment where humanity just doesn't care. So in some regards, plastic surgery will not ever go away. I don't think, like there are certain professions that eventually go become extinct, like thoracic surgery has fewer and fewer procedures for them to do because interventional cardiologists are doing them without having to do surgery. So that's a perfect example. Here there used to be, you want a valve, they did it to you open heart surgery. You wanted a bypass, they did it open heart. Now they're doing all this stuff through scans and arteries and stents and all this amazing technology. So thoracic surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons are having less and less work to do. So I don't see that happening in plastic surgery. The biggest concern I have in plastic surgery is that because of the financial drive, why do you think there are 700 and million drugs for blood pressure and diabetes, but if you have some bizarre case of some condition, we don't have drugs. Is it because they haven't figured it out? No, it's because money talks and drug companies are going to make drugs for conditions where a lot of people have it, where money will be spent. So resources are spent on things that generate money. So surgeries are being developed and non surgical stuff is being developed by the minute. There is so much money in cosmetic surgery. And my biggest concern, fear, disappointment is I'm not concerned. If you notice the surgeries that I do today are more or less the same surgeries they did 50 years ago. Eh, there's a little change, but all this non-surgical stuff is new. And every year, it is exponentially more. On the one hand, that's great. New shit's coming out. But for every one really useful non-surgical item, there is a hundred garbages. And it only becomes a garbage after hundreds of thousands of people have used it and it didn't work. So the problem is that the testing ground for all this non-surgical, nonsensical shit are people. So people are the guinea pigs for the majority of things that come out that don't really work. And because they're being done by average people like practitioners, you know, surgery is not my concern. You can't just get up and go 
do a nose job. That, that's just not going to happen. You can't. But I can, shit, I can teach you how to run this machine, Maria. And so my biggest fear for the next five to 10 years is more and more nonsense that people are going to have to siphon through and as a result, waste money on, have bad outcomes and stuff like that. That's my biggest concern. Now, in, in the in let's say if we rewind in the last five to 10 years, have you seen anything uh, develop or uh, improve in plastic surgery? Yeah, I mean, listen, I don't think, I think surgeries refine, mm -hmm. right? This facelift we described, the deep plane, it's been around for a very long time. Rhinoplasty, which I love, is half of my practice. It's come a long way, but it's still a nose job. We're not like doing your nose job through your armpit. It's not like some massive innovation. So what's happening in the surgical world is this refinement. Mm -hmm. You know, like Botox didn't exist many years ago. Fillers have come a tremendous way, right? We used to use collagen and all kinds of horse-driven horse shit that would cause allergies. So I'm not opposed to innovation. I love innovation. I just don't like the fact that, you know, people assume, oh, there's this laser, right? It's in a doctor's office. So the FDA approved it. The FDA has one job. It shouldn't kill you. <laughs> the FDA's job isn't it worked or it's very effective. You follow what I'm trying to say? So um, I don't know. I don't I, listen in my practice. I don't have a lot of stuff in my practice. What do I have? I had a cool sculpting machine, which I still have that I use here and there. And that's it. I don't have anything else non-surgical and Botox and filler. Mm -hmm. I don't know. To me, I'm a, maybe I'm an old, maybe no, I'm an old geezer mentality. I like effective shit. I don't like all this nonsensical things that you got to do 17 rounds. And I also don't like the easier it gets, the more untrained people do it. Mm -hmm. Right? When something is really difficult to drive, then only people with very special licenses can drive those cars or trucks or forklifts. Right. When it becomes easy, then everyone drives it and then everyone creates crashes. Yeah. So I don't know. I haven't, I, 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 I'm biased. I also do a tremendous revision work, right? That's like half my practice is revision shit. So I just mm -hmm. keep seeing people botched constantly. I know, that's so scary. Well, that's it. That's all the questions we have for this episode. That's it? That's it. All right. Cool. All right, guys. Well, that wraps up uh, yet another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. I'm going to do my usual plea. If you like our show, if you love our show, if you think our show is interesting, entertaining, I don't care, go write something nice. Go write a review. Say something pleasant. We live in a very nasty world. People are very quick to write nasty things, not so quick to write nice things. If you don't like our show, great. Don't listen to it anymore. And if you have people that you think would benefit from this information, share it. Please share it with friends. We really appreciate it. Download and subscribe. Again, the only purpose of the show is for you guys to listen. So if I know you're out there, we'll keep doing it. Until next time, I'm your host, Dr. Roger Vaughn, signing off on Plastic Surgery Uncensored.